50 years ago, two neighboring settlements along the coast of Long Island Sound, Stratford and Fairfield, merged part of their land to form the city of Bridgeport. Today, that city is the largest in the state of Connecticut. But the sense of community that existed in those early settlements has remained in Bridgeport, thanks to the legacy of its neighborhoods and their strong ethnic roots. This is a story of those neighborhoods and their people. The Pequannock Indians were the first known settlers of the land along Bridgeport's westernmost shore, historically known as Black Rock Village. Today, the section of the city bordering Long Island Sound is Bridgeport's only historic neighborhood. The early colonists built up the fishing, oystering, and shipbuilding trades until they became large-scale industries by the late 18th century, and Black Rock Harbor became the official port of entry for Fairfield County. But by 1830, steamship routes began to bypass Black Rock in favor of the more protected harbor at the mouth of the Pequannock River. And as manufacturing took hold further north in the heart of the city, the importance of the waterfront began to decline. But now, a century and a half later, a Black Rock resident is trying to bring the days of glory back to the seaport community. When former lobster fisherman Kay Williams first looked at the dilapidated city-owned docks back in 1981, he kept an open mind and saw potential beauty where others saw only decay. For sure, the, the, the grounds were in bad shape and the dump was there and all, but um, you have to remember that um, this, this waterway continues on. I mean, it, the water you're up against right now, who the heck knows how it would get there. <laughs> it winds up in Europe or whatever, but I, you know, that's your backyard and it just, it just flows from this place here. So uh, this is just a, a, a starting point uh, for people that uh, run in and out of the marina to go anywhere or anywhere they so desire, you know. And uh, so I, I didn't look at it as a, um, yeah, I thought that the, you know, the boats and the docks and all, I could combat the uh, ugliness of what was here. Five years later, the feisty Irishman has succeeded in transforming a once shabby marina into a colorful nautical attraction called Captain's Cove. It features a restaurant, a fish market, and a string of colonial-style shops along the wharf. And William says his confidence in the project and in his city is paying off. I have a lot of people come down and say, Jesus, uh, are we in um, Bridgeport? And I said, of course you're in Bridgeport, you know. Uh, which makes me believe that when they brought other people down, they just said, let's go to Captain's Cove, and they didn't say they were going to Bridgeport. And that's kind of embarrassing, but um, it's a fact. I mean, we have an image to overcome in Bridgeport, and, uh, and um, between now and the turn of the century, I think we will. The main attraction at Captain's Cove is the HMS Rose, a 200-year-old replica of a British frigate that Williams is restoring. He says with the Rose as a so-called flagship, he hopes more commercial fishermen and lobstermen will use the cove as a base of operations to farm the sea, the way Bill Smith and Nick DiGennaro are now doing. The two men head out from the cove daily in search of the tasty crustaceans they sell at the cove fish market. There's a female with eggs. She has no eggs. I like the challenge of being on the water, you know. And uh, there's no, you know, I don't have a guaranteed paycheck every day or every week. And, you know, I, what I make is because of what I do, you know, the amount of effort that I put into it. William says it's going to take a lot of effort for Bridgeport to reclaim its position as a significant port city. But he's confident it can be done. This uh, cove would not have worked had it not been that the people wanted it. I feel like, yeah, I was like a tool in between, but the people wanted the cove, and that's why the cove works. And it, and it's, it's been great. People have been really great, very receptive to it. Well, my father was here, and I had another brother two years older than I was, and uh, we used to come in after school. We actually grew up in the business. He made us start in this business, start from that end, and you work up. You brush, you shine, you know, you finish, sew, and then you work. And, uh, you know, 
the shops at that time were paying like uh, 40, 50 cents an hour. And my father working here maybe made $35 a week. Robert Ozzy has been a shoemaker in the city's north end nearly all his life. He learned the trade from his father who came from Italy and opened up this storefront shop back in 1924. It was three of us, you know, my father and my brother and myself. And uh, we work in harmony and uh, we really enjoyed it. Since the turn of the century, the neighborhood has been home to thousands of Irish and Italian immigrants whose strong sense of family and of community has given the North End a village identity in the heart of the city. But that hasn't always been easy. Many immigrant families in Bridgeport suffered and were divided during the Great Depression. But Ozzy's family survived because there is always work for shoemakers. It looked like good days to us because my father was here. You know, he made a living. And actually, we didn't feel the depression too, too much. But I remember going to school, kids had to go for milk and uh, bread, you know, and they were, they were on welfare. Ozzy says he is proud that he carries on in the tradition of his father. He's still repairing it to dining art. Nobody takes it up. When, when the father dies, the place uh, closes up. No one, no one takes over. Whereas in other business, you know, they keep on going. His shoe repair shop is wedged between the north end and the hollow sections of the city. Through the glass of his wide front window, Ozzy has watched the city's street life change over the past 50 years. Yeah, well, there's a beautiful picture window here. You can see all over, you know. And, uh, Bridgeport has changed. The industry has changed. So, Factories, you know, it was a lot of factories, a very industrial city. But uh, the fact that a lot of factories moved out, I think made a big change in Bridgeport. Well, there were more people walking years ago. You know, it used to be like a procession, especially on a Saturday. Everybody going downtown, coming back, back. Today, it's all cars. E even the kids you don't see going to school, they, they're on buses or their, their parents take them and uh, they don't even see the kids. You see a few, but I mean, uh, in comparison. You know. But Ozzy isn't bitter about losing the past. He has been able to change with the times. Well, you got to go with the times. I guess that's the way uh, the trend is. So that's, uh, that's the new generation. You know, you can't compare what you had with what they have. We enjoy ourselves one way, and they're enjoying themselves a different way. Ozzy says even though many of Bridgeport's giant industries have folded up and left over the years, he's happy that he and other small shopkeepers have been able to stay because he loves his work in Bridgeport. I enjoy it, you know. It, it's, uh, you're fixing shoes, but every pair is different. You know, every job is different. It's not like you work in a factory, do the same thing for eight hours. Here, everything is different. Then you talk to people. People come in, different people. All walks of life. Like Ozzy says, shoes are a necessity. Master baker John DeMarco says the same is true about his creations. The North End Baker has been building cakes to celebrate major events in Bridgeport for nearly two decades. Whether it's the anniversary of a hospital, the grand opening of a shopping center, or the celebration of a concert, Park City residents turn to DeMarco to commemorate the most important events in their lives. If you hand John a cake pan, pastry tube, and a challenge, he'll happily create the world's largest cherry pie, Big Mac bun, or Italian cannoli. I like the challenge of making the biggest cake and uh, uh, the biggest, big of something, big, of, big cannoli, big eclair, uh, you know, some, something that other people can do it. John DeMarco came to Bridgeport from Italy when he was a young boy. After years of working as a chef and a baker in the city's north end, he opened up his own Italian bakery on Main Street in 1968. He called it Luigi's because it was the most Italian sounding name he could think of. But there is no Luigi, there is only John DeMarco, the main reason for the shop's success. You know, I like what I'm doing. And uh, once you like it, it's not, it's not like you're fighting it's not like you're fighting for. It comes natural to you. Uh, so I did, you know, I did go to school in the old country, and uh, it 
So it's two things put together, school plus practice. The master chefs at Luigi's produce tray loads of miniature Italian pastries and dozens of birthday, anniversary, and wedding cakes every day. Yeah, this has got to get cut over here. Over here, right? Not yeah. there. Cut over here, over here. And we've got to put it together here. So you've got to get a knife and cut this here flush. Then put, a, then put buttercream on the pads. The staff of about 100 works as a team under John's watchful eye. But what really makes it all click is the home-style atmosphere in the kitchen. Try to create that uh, we could all work together, um, work like family. Um, a lot of the customers think that, uh, you know, part of the staff is part of the family. John sets the example he expects his workers to follow. He usually puts in at least six days a week, often passing up social engagements, working past midnight until the job is done. Putting in the time, um, whatever time it takes. Everything, everything else stays behind. If I, if I gotta go to a wedding, I don't go to it. If I gotta go to a party, I won't go to a party. Uh, whatever business it takes. If, I, if you're the bride and I promise you that the cake will be there, the cake has gotta be there. I, I can't slack off. Uh, if I was to slack off, uh, I think I would get sick. Uh, I, I wanna be part of it. I, uh, I work seven days a week if I have to. Whatever, whatever business it takes, that's what I put in do my best anyway. This is how I take my frustration out. Instead of hitting the employees over the head. <laughs> right, Danny? It's hard to believe that such demanding physical labor can lead to such delicate works of art. About 80 times a week, Luigi's produces its specialty, wedding cakes so unique that even the tiny attendants that adorn the layers are hand painted to match the wedding party's color scheme. Normally, it's normally custom made to fit in the amount of people that they're going to have. If there's 50 people, you want to make something simple so it doesn't take the main traction to the way, you know, to the, to the bride and the groom. All of this dedication has not gone unnoticed in the Bridgeport community. This year, John has been named the city's Italian American of the Year. It's an honor that puts the icing on the cake, so to speak, to a life that's been devoted to making the special moments of other Bridgeporters more memorable. In Bridgeport's early days, the church served as the center of the neighborhood, whether it was Greek, Russian, or German. It was a place the immigrants could come to hear their own language, practice their own religion, and mix with their own people. Such was the case in the west end of the city, where Albanians, Hungarians, and Romanians formed a Slavic community. Today, the Romanian church is still the gathering place for 300 Eastern European families who like nothing better than to prepare and celebrate a traditional harvest festival. Well, we're mostly um, ethnic Macedonian Romanians from Macedonia, which no longer exists, but there are people from Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, all of um, Romanian heritage. According to George Coca, the West End has one of the strongest Romanian communities in America, and it's one of the closest-knit neighborhoods in Bridgeport. It seemed that if you went north or south of it, you were in strange territory. So it had always been a, a tie with the West End, and our church is still located in the West End, even though most of the people now live in Fairfield and East End and Trumbull. We still look to the West End as our uh, a little bit of home away from home. Days before the festival, the women of the church roll out cookies and pastries and prepare stuffed cabbages. George's wife, Marianne, is in charge of baking 500 loaves of a special sweet bread for the event. Well, they really enjoy our sweet bread, which is a traditional sweet bread. And then we made specially for the holidays or for special feast days. And um, it's a recipe which is uh, um, given from mother to daughter from generations. 
and uh, everybody makes a little different, but it's basically the same thing. The church fathers say the big turnout at the gathering proves that the next generation wants to keep its roots in Bridgeport and to carry on in the tradition of its elders. Bridgeport's transition from a small fishing village to a prosperous factory town created a boom era in the early 1900s. By then, Bridgeport was in the midst of an industrial whirl. Hundreds of businesses moved into the city's east side. Some were large factories, others small shops, and together they pumped out munitions for World War I troops and commercial products for the American consumer. The city's east side became known as one of the industrial centers of New England. If you could make it and sell it, you could do it in Bridgeport. Waves of immigrants from more than 60 countries swelled the ranks of the city's workforce, and many settled on the east side to be close to the jobs. But by mid-century, with the demands of the Second World War winding down, many of Bridgeport's heavy industrial plants were forced to close their doors. The American Fabrics Company, a lace fabric mill, was one plant that continued to thrive. It was founded in 1907 by the Henkels, a German immigrant family who brought their lace-making skills to the U.S. market. They opened their plant at the peak of the nation's demand for the frilly cloth. In downtown Bridgeport, stacks of the precious lace could be found gracing the window displays at Howland's department store. The lace company was family-run then, and it still is today. Only the name has changed. The Ostrover family bought the giant mill on Connecticut Avenue back in 1948. Robert Ostrover is vice president of the family concern. This is a family. Um, most of the people that are here have uh, been here for many years. Um, a lot of people here, their families have been working here. Um, generations of family have worked here. Generations of my family seem to be working here. Um, it's like home in a lot of ways. Today, American Fabrics knits three kinds of lace. Rochelle, produced on high-speed machines. Clooney lace, a braided strand used for trimming cloth and embroideries. With nearly 800 workers, the company is the city's fifth largest employer. It's part of the core of major industries that are ensuring a healthy future for Bridgeport. While other textile mills have moved south in search of cheaper labor, the Ostrovers have resisted the temptation. You just keep struggling to stay here. This, like I said, this is our home. Um, I have a nice home that I bought 10 years ago or 12 years ago, and I don't picture myself living in the south. Uh, I'm just not a good old boy. Decisions like the one by American Fabrics to stay in Bridgeport are a source of hope for many of the city's Hispanic workers who came here looking for homes, jobs, and a future they could count on. Like many Hispanics now living in Bridgeport, Cesar Batalla's father left Puerto Rico in the 1950s and settled his family on the east side. They came for economic reasons. Someone mentioned Bridgeport. Uh, is it possible that it's a beautiful town, uh, good jobs, uh, there were many industry here, and you know, uh, you'd be able to get a job there fairly easy and the housing was good and it was, uh, it was a good town to live in, and it still is, and so that, that was you know, the major reasons why he chose Bridgeport. At the time, there were more jobs than people in Bridgeport, and Hispanics were able to live and work near the east side factories. The community has since grown to become the third largest ethnic group in the city. People who came looking for temporary jobs decided to stay. Where people have reached the, 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 the if anything, the economic reality that there's no going back. This is, this is our city. This is our state. This is our nation, and we better do what we can to improve our own lives and to improve our own country. Lower East Main Street is the center of the Hispanic community. The street and neighborhood, which had fallen into disrepair, are now going through major changes. Successful news stores like Luis Furniture are breathing life and hope back into the neighborhood. There were stores all the way up and down the street. I mean, Hispanic stores. And slowly but surely, they, I mean, they were not owned by the people that lived here. 
So slowly by surely they, they deteriorated and they got burned down. Caesar is a spokesman for the Puerto Rican coalition in the city. And although he doesn't think of himself as a leader, many people in the community do. On the streets, neighbors view him as someone they can turn to for advice about their problems. He doesn't have any money, he's living in his own car because he lost everything in that business. Caesar works mostly through the school system to help improve the educational opportunities for his people. You have educated people, people will find their own way and people will find their own leadership in, 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 in a more educated manner if they're educated themselves. He says the Hispanic community has a tremendous potential to shape the future of Bridgeport. I think our role should be definitely uh, one of building this community and rebuilding this community. I think it should be one of, of exerting ourselves a lot more and demanding and taking a lot more of the, uh, of the, um, of the, um, of the lead as it relates to solving problems. They call them storefront churches, and there are dozens of the tiny chapels scattered throughout Bridgeport. Most of them line the streets of Stratford Avenue in the city's predominantly black East End. Sometimes as many as three or four churches compete for parishioners on the same block. Half a century ago, Robert Plummer founded one such storefront and called it the Full Gospel Pentecostal Church. Today his grandson, Walter Plummer, is bishop and pastor of the storefront church that grew into a full congregation. He remembers how it all started. He would gather a few believers in his family and with his guitar he would sing music, preach a message and offer Jesus Christ to the people. The church was founded in the city's ghetto where Plummer's grandfather felt he could do the most good. Many times as a child I remember standing outside in the midst of street meetings while we were on one side of the street praising the Lord on the other side of the street I recall uh, I recall a man taking a uh, picket out of a fence with a nail in it and beating a woman. Bishop Plummer says he never thought he would carry on his family's ministry. He wanted to be a doctor. But one day, at a crossroads in his life, he felt the call to preach. When you're talking minorities, especially black people, uh, sometimes we feel that you cannot do it through the system, so you try to do it your own way. Bishop Plummer's way is inspiring, to say the least. Pentecostal Church moved seven times before it finally settled on Beechwood Avenue. Today, the mortgage is paid and the congregation is thriving. Do what you want to do this morning in this service, Lord. Say what you want to say, God, in the name of Jesus. Pentecostal boasts five choirs, including the popular and powerful Voices of Deliverance. Bishop Plummer has many moral as well as spiritual messages for his followers. You see, when times get very bad on earth and seems like things are getting out of hand, such as the drug problem that has almost captured the world today, uh, drugs seem like it's breaking up families. society today, especially in the United States, where there's so much freedom, where there's so much access to things, where there's so much money and room for rackets and organized crime, the church has a big battle. And we need to gather our forces together and get into the heat of the battle. A 
century ago, the opulent Victorian-style homes in Bridgeport South End, along with those across town on the east side, rounded off the rough industrial edges of the city. The names on the mailboxes read like a who's who in Bridgeport. The Hawleys, the Hubbles, and the Howlands all took up residence here along West Avenue. In the late 19th century, they built splendidly ornate homes, faced with scalloped clabbered and embellished with gingerbread trim. But over the years, the mansions became too expensive to maintain, and many were turned into boarding houses. But now, some courageous urban pioneers have taken up residence along Mansion Row and are trying to restore a bygone era. Because the area was uh, simply so uh, elegant at the turn of the century, this was a rich man's street. Uh, they didn't call it Mansion Row because it was uh, a skid row here. Very wealthy men built these houses. And the really attractive thing about it is that they spared no expense. Bob Boudreau is a former contractor turned restorationist. He now owns three Victorian houses in the South End. His jewel is this Queen Anne style home built in 1893, which he's restoring down to the finest detail. Some areas, like for instance this here, you can't scrape it e effectively. You'll have to sand with the block here to make it perfectly clean. That's what I did here. Yeah, right. The house was originally built for the sum of $15,000. Bob estimates it would cost more than a million dollars to duplicate it today. But it's just waiting to be restored. And, and that's the kick that I get out of it, is restoring it back to the opulence and grandeur that it originally enjoyed at the turn of the century. These houses are a feast for the eye when they're restored, both inside and out. West side, the east side, they all have their stories of their immigrant groups that came in, built beautiful churches, nice houses, uh, fixed them up, they had pride. That's a big, that's a big point. You've got to have pride in your neighborhood. Although Bob has spent months going over every inch of the house, it still holds surprises for him. One day, in a dusty corner room in the basement, he unearthed an unexpected treasure. Bottles of fruits and vegetables that were preserved at the turn of the century. Hey, you know, it smells pretty interesting. <laughs> Not bad at all, really. The discovery brought the house to life for him and strengthened his philosophy. Uh, a renaissance thing almost, in which we're all neighbors, we're friends. Uh, I have a cup of coffee at your house, you have one at my house, and we're, we all pull together to... Uh, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a, a neighborhood of real neighbors, people who care about each other, and. Uh, and are protecting each other. Neighbors and neighborhoods taking care of each other. They've made Bridgeport great, and they'll keep Bridgeport strong. <laughs>